Happy Monday, everybody. Um, I wanted to try something a little different, which was to kind of send you um, an overview of the module for the week through the video, and also just make a few comments about um, the poems and text that we talked about last week. So uh, you can find sort of a written version of this if you go to Canvas and you go to the module and you'll see the you know module five at a, a schedule at a glance. It sort of summarizes for you everything that's due for that week. Um, but I thought maybe having a, a video would help too because I know we're lacking that kind of um, face-to-face uh, ver uh, version in our, in our class since it's uh, mostly asynchronous. Um, I will also throw out that invitation again too if there are a few of you who are interested um, in having um, some Zoom sessions every now and then to talk about some text, we can do that. I've had a couple of people express interest, so I'm going to reach out to those people. Um, so if you are someone who would be interested in a Zoom that fits in with your schedule, uh, do send me an email so I can be sure and reach out to you as well. Um, these would be completely voluntary and to just kind of help you with the readings um, and to just experience some discussions, which I know we're missing in this class. So before I talk about uh, this week and what you need to be focusing on, I wanted to say just a bit about um, the Nightingale poems that we read last week, um, which it was really delightful to read through um, the discussion that we had. I just um, finished uh, grading the last of those so you can see that. Uh, and then also that reminds me, I wanted to make sure that people knew that I often comment in grade books. So be sure you're using that comment feature. Um, and if you're having trouble accessing those comments, let me know. Um, so I'll also be sending out the summary of our discussion in a little bit. So I thought right here what I would do is just share with you my favorite passage from each of the poems, um, sort of give you the comparison that I would do um, that I asked you guys to do. Um, and so I'm gonna start with Samuel's poem. Um, which is, as we talked about in the module, notes a conversation poem, and many of you noted the differences in the tone from his and from Keats and Sarah Coleridge. So uh, if you look at um, the, th the second uh, kind of stanza, although it looks more like a paragraph, the way that he's written his poem, so there's one really long initial stanza, and then I'm just gonna read the second stanza to you. This is from Samuel Coleridge's poem. My friend and thou, our sister, we have learnt a different lore. We may not thus profane nature's sweet voices, always full of love and joyance. Tis the merry nightingale that crowds and hurries and precipitates with fast, thick warble his delicious notes. As he were fearful that an April night would be too short for him to utter forth his love chant and disburthen his full soul, of all its music. So a couple things that I like about this stanza is that this is where he makes the turn. As many of you noted, um, the first stanza was Samuel kind of cataloging how in, in history and in previous literature, people uh, and poets represented the nightingale in this melancholy way. And so here we hear, we see the speaker of Coulter's poem saying, we have learned a different lore, right? Lore sort of meaning here story or experience. Um, also what's interesting if we're thinking about connections between our authors, my friend and thou, our sister, refers to Wordsworth and Dorothy, right? So here's Samuel, the actual author, kind of coming through his speaker um, and referencing um, people that are important in his life. So he's saying, you know, Wordsworth, uh, William and Dorothy, don't you guys remember? Like, we know the Nightingale sings a different song. Um, and then he gives this great image, right, of the Nightingale so full of joy that she's worried the night is gonna end before she can get all of her joy out through her song, right? Um, so, the, so this sort of crowding and hurrying, right? This sort of fear uh, that the night's gonna run out because there's so much joy. Um, I really loved how some of you noted, uh, and you'll see this in the, the summary notes that I put out, that some of you noted that while Samuel seems to not want other people to impose um, an emotion on the bird, particularly a sad emotion. In some ways, he's also imposing um, a happy emotion on nature, which I thought was a really smart um, insight um, that a few of you made. And so here we can see him doing that, right? Um, that uh, nature is always full of love and joyance, uh, says line sort of 42 and 43, right? So that was a part that I really liked in Samuel's. Um, I'm gonna turn to Sarah's poem now. And like many of you, I found that final stanza to be really fascinating um, because Sarah does something so differently with the bird. 
Um, she, first of all, personifies the bird, not only through the Philomela reference, as you guys mentioned, but also she gives it the, the female pronoun, which in Coleridge's poem, he often refers to the bird as he. So that final stanza says, she grieves when boys have robbed her nest, but so would stork or starling. What mother would not weep and cry to lose her precious darling? Um, so yes, we see that very maternal domestic image here. Um, I've really been thinking about this, uh, and obviously several of you, of course, noted that difference and talked really beautifully about it, um, but we sort of have a domestic reference as well at the end of Samuel's, and I for the first time realized I was neglecting that because I was thinking of the father and the child, and because we so strongly associate the domestic realms with female, I think we have to realize that actually Samuel's also has a domestic realm, right? It's it's a family. It's a father comforting his son. That's sort of in the, placed in the home. Um, and it's even sort of that maternal role of comforting, right? Um, so I, I started kind of asking myself, what is where really is the distinction then between Sarah's and Samuel's? If we could kind of say they both end in this domestic way, right? Um, so a couple, a couple ideas I have about that, and I'd be curious to hear what you all think. Um, Sarah is giving the bird the actual maternal qualities, right? Whereas Samuel uh, is inviting the bird into a domestic scene, right? But not necessarily making the bird um, herself the, the maternal or paternal image. Um, and I think this really aligns with what some of you guys were saying, where Sarah's representation of the bird seems much more personalized and empathetic to the bird itself, right? It's more focused on the bird rather than um, kind of the context in which we find the bird, right? Whether it's the speaker or nature, um, the speaker's relationship with his son. So that's kind of one difference. The other one is, um, as you all noticed, Sarah's poem takes a very sort of dark, sad turn at the end. Um, so while Sarah sees the nightingale as joyous like her father, she seems to not want to let people off the hook. And, and that's kind of what I'm wondering if maybe this is what's going on. If there's a kind of sort of ecological and ethical critique made here in the last stanza because Sarah represents not nature and humanity working together, but humanity um, destroying nature um, and that that is what causes the nightingale and any other kind of bird right stork or starling or other mother to be sad so that was kind of interesting for me too that Sarah is really using this moment of the nightingale trope to maybe call into question when humans are relating unethically to nature um, it could make Sarah's poem really interesting in our contemporary time as well since we have um, sort of uh, much more ecological concerns than they even had in the Victorian period and kind of how, what are we doing with, with nature and what are the ethics of how we care for it. So that was kind of an interesting thought for me. And then finally with Keats' poem, um, oops, I flipped the wrong way. Um, Keats' poem, I wanted to look at stanza three. Um, partly I like this poem because of all the alliteration. <laughs> Um, but it does a really great job of describing Keats's desire to escape. He thinks the nightingale gets to escape uh, the sort of misery of being human. So we can hear that in stanza three. Fade far away, he's talking to the nightingale here, right? Dissolve and quite forget what thou amongst the leaves has never known, right? The nightingale who lives up here never has to know the following. The weariness, the fever, and the fret. Here where men sit and hear each other groan where palsy shakes a few sad last gray hairs where youth grows pale and specter thin and dies. Um, so Keats's perspective of human life, right, is that it's, it's full of misery, which partly this is biographical. His own family died very young, and then of course Keats himself died young as well. But what's interesting about this is following stanza three, if you look at stanza five, Keats desires to transcend all these miseries and join the bird, but then he realizes that that's problematic as well, right? So in stanza five, he says, I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, nor what soft incense hangs above the boughs, but in embalmed darkness, guess each sweet, wherewith the seasonable month endows the grass, the thicket, and the fruit tree wild, white hawthorn and pastoral eglantine, and then he sort of goes on and catalogs flowers. So he has just, in his imagination, joined the bird in flight, 
and he looks down and he realizes, I can't see anything that's going on down there anymore. I can't see the details of the beauty that I love about the earth. So I often read this moment as a kind of a realization that there's, there is a drawback to transcendence, right? There's a drawback to escapism, which is that there is beautiful things about human life and there are beautiful things about being grounded to the earth and you would lose those things if you did transcend. Um, so that's kind of one movement in the poem that I really enjoy. So be sure and look at the summary of the discussion that you guys had where I pull together some of your comments just sort of as a follow-up of me sharing some of what I love about those three poems. If you enjoyed the comparison activity of last week, then I think you'll also really enjoy this week. We're going to focus the first part of the week because the engage activity asks you to focus on Hemmins, um, Eliel, Letitia Elizabeth Landon, and EBB, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, and you've already read some EBB um, at the very beginning of our course. These three poets are often uh, good representations of what it was called the poetess. I'm not going to explain what the poetess is here. Uh, you can go read. Uh, there's a very detailed description of that in the module, but it's very important that you think about what the poetess is before you go read these poems. But these three poets are actually talking to one another through their poems, which is really interesting. They did not meet one another, um, but they respected one another. And Hemans was first chronologically. Um, and then EBB and LEL were uh, basically contemporaries of one another. So Hemans is kind of the sort of foremother or f forerunner uh, uh, that LEL and EBB could look up to as an example of a poetess. So notice sort of the conversational nature um, and what we could call the citational nature of their poems, right? They cite one another by name uh, or by an allusion to their name, which the footnotes will help tell you. Uh, so be sure you read kind of the head note before each poem that will explain to you the situation of the poem and the footnotes along the way will really help you as well. Um, I would also recommend that you read the material that's summarizing for you Tig's Psyche. It's a very long poem and you're not reading the whole thing and so it'll help give you the larger context. Um, and Keats's Ode to Psyche is kind of a bizarre poem. Um, I'm glad you had some experience with Keats already with his Ode to Nightingale. Um, it might help you access Ode to Psyche a little bit more. But if you read the material about Mary Tig's Psyche, it will help you understand what um, Keats is trying to do with his ode in terms of identity, particularly poetic identity. You might also go ahead and take a look at the discussion board response at the end um, because the question could help guide kind of what you're looking for as you're reading. So we've got our engage activity on Wednesday. We've got our reading response uh, that's due on Friday, just as normal. And then some of you have um, peer responses and scholarly conversations due as well. And all that is detailed for you in the schedule at a glance. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to say is just about the critical introduction. I'll be working through uh, the first part that you turned in to me, the sort of two-page biography part. Um, and I'm going to make a separate video of this kind of the next step, which is to complete that biography section uh, by looking at the writer's letters. Um, so be sure that you check out that video. It will be posted later today, um, and I'll send you an email about it. Um, and it'll have sort of the due date for that and very detailed instructions about how to access letters and how to write about them. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, be sure and shoot me an email. I hope the video explanation will help make things clear as well. Um, so enjoy our poems this week. and We should have some good kind of rainy afternoon today and tomorrow. It might be great for curling up and thinking about um, some poems. <laughs>